The Shooting Range. In this episode, Pages of History, The Battle for the Chinese Farm. Tactics and Strategy, Surviving on a Fighter. And Metal Beasts, a special event version of the Eel 2. Once again, we'll be talking about the vent machines. Specifically, another vehicle that you can get for participating in the third season of World War. Meet the Il-2 M82. Its origins go back to the time when the assembly of the inline AM38 engines in the Soviet Union became endangered. In order not to affect the production of the famous Il-2 attack aircraft, it was decided to change its design, allowing the use of a radial engine. Here it is, the Schwitzhoff M82 air-cooled radial engine. It can accelerate the vehicle up to 406 km per hour. The two-spar wing is attached to the armored capsule consisting of armor sheets from 4 to 8 mm thick as well as 64 mm thick armored glass. Together, they protect the gunner, the pilot, and the self-sealing fuel tanks. The armament consists of two 7.62 mm machine guns and two 20 mm cannons. Plus, there's a turret with a heavy caliber machine gun for protection against enemy fighters. The main thing is, of course, the widest range of suspended weapons against ground targets. The Il-2 is a formidable attack aircraft, and its potential is best demonstrated in mixed battles. Usually, rockets would be most effective. We recommend taking eight of the RBS-132 ones, armor-piercing with more than a kilogram of TNT inside. They will almost certainly turn any target into a pile of scrap metal in case of successful penetration. Don't forget about 100 kilogram bombs as well. They require a certain amount of skill, so at first you might want to forget about saving and drop the entire amount of these onto one opponent. And then eventually, when you get used to them, you'll be able to distribute bombs in lesser quantities and destroy more tanks per flight. When it comes to threats, the greatest one for the Il-2 is, of course, ground-based air defense systems. As long as a single anti-aircraft vehicle is active on the map, the hunt for enemy tanks may end in vain and to no avail at any moment. It's better to wait until your ground forces eliminate the AA vehicle in question or to take an ally with you and attack it together from both your forward-facing weapons. By the way, the Schwach cannons are effective not only against AA tech with open cabins, but also against light ground vehicles. You can penetrate the roofs of turrets and engine compartments and disable crew members, as well as engines and other modules. Let's not forget about air targets as well. Sure, you might run into problems against fighters, but bombers are your rightful prey. You aren't inferior to them in terms of speed. Your offensive firepower is more than enough, and the armored capsule will provide some minimal protection. The Yom Kippur War, also known as the October War, is one of the darkest pages in the history of the Middle East. Having suffered the defeat of the Six-Day War, the Arab coalition spent six more years gathering its forces to launch a massive attack on October the 6th, 1973, in the midst of the Jewish holiday Yom Kippur. In the first hours of the war, the advance of the Egyptian and the Syrian armies was unstoppable. But after a couple of days, the tanks halted. They couldn't stretch their communications any further, and most importantly, they couldn't break away from the cover of their own air defenses, 
especially since the invasion was going in several directions at once. It was the best moment for the Israel Defense Forces to seize the lead. They had to counterattack immediately, right at the intersection of the two enemy armies, just along the highway threading through an experimental irrigation station nicknamed the Chinese Farm. This attack would allow the IDF to reach back to the Suez Canal and therefore cut off Egyptian tanks from their supplies, disable their air defenses and destroy their headquarters. At the same time, they would be able to get some bomb squads towards that direction and set up a passage across the canal in the opposite direction to launch their own offense at Cairo. The plan was risky and bold. On October 15, Israeli tanks led by the latest M60A1s of Ariel Sharon's division went into counterattack. But the enemy figured them out and rushed to intercept. And while the first Israeli tanks were exploding on the hastily set up minefields, the Egyptians were pulling their armored forces towards the Chinese farm and its irrigation canals. Within an hour, tanks on both sides came together in a terrible battle. Their sides were often separated only by a couple of meters, as they were firing at point-blank range in clouds of dust and smoke. In his memoirs, Ariel Sharon called it a hand-to-hand -hand battle of armor, and it was perhaps the most accurate comparison one could come up with. Who was where, who was going where, and by whose orders? Soon it all became impossible to make out. Both sides were throwing more and more forces into the unfolding massacre, where they were violently crushing each other almost blindly. The number of vehicles destroyed went into the hundreds, and aviation was adding even more confusion as it often attacked everything that was able to move and still wasn't burning. Under the cover of night, the Israeli tanks managed to break through to the Soez Canal, but the coming morning turned them into convenient targets for the Egyptian T-55s and T-62s surrounding them from the north and south. The battle went into a new phase. The Egyptians were now pressing in from all sides, trying to close the breach in their orders at all costs, while the Israelis were holding the corridor and trying to widen it. The land around the Chinese farm was shaking from the explosions. Hundreds of tanks were firing, artillery shell explosions merged into a continuous rumble, and in the sky there were frequent skirmishes between planes. By the end of the 17th of October, the outcome became clear. The IDF managed to secure its positions on the Suez Canal. The Israeli forces set up a passage into Egypt and entered the attacker's rear. Separate attacks on the Chinese farm lasted for several more hours, but their outcome was already predetermined. Having suffered terrible losses, the Egyptian army retreated hastily. The battle for the Chinese farm went down in history as the biggest tank battle since World War II. It also formed the basis of a scenario of the same name in the third season of War Thunder's World War. Hurry up, the battles on the global map have already begun, and their outcome depends only on you. The battlefield is not the safest place for a fragile fighter. Your flight can be interrupted by a single stray bullet or a round from an enemy cannon. Today, we'll talk about how not to lose your plane early and what threats you should focus on. First, we'll set up our view. For that, let's quickly assign a handy button in Controls, Common, View Control, Mouse Look Activation. Having pressed it, we can freely monitor the situation, while at the same time continuing to control the aircraft with the keyboard. That's all we need in the control settings so far. Time to move on to the tactics. 
We'll start with air battles. At the beginning of the game, gain some altitude and stay close to your allies. The greatest threat comes, of course, from enemy fighters, especially those that are higher than you are. To dodge an attack from above, roll over your wing and go down under the enemy while constantly breaking your trajectory to make it harder for them to turn to you. And when your opponent starts going up, it's time to counterattack. Fire a couple of bursts from all the guns you have. Even if you don't hit the target, it'll have to dodge, losing speed and altitude. Generally, rivalry for altitude is one of the key elements of air combat. With all else being equal, usually the winner is the one who managed to get higher. Therefore, the general battle plan for us looks somewhat like this. First, we deal with those above us. Then we start going lower, thoroughly clearing the sky below. The priority targets are the ones that outperform you. That way, you'll only be facing the simplest targets by the time you've used up a significant amount of your ammo, and it won't be difficult to shoot them down. If you're playing on a jet fighter, there's another threat to beware. Air-to-air -air guided missiles. The simplest of them can be evaded by sharply changing the trajectory of your flight. But this trick won't save you against the more modern ones. For example, the French Matra R550 Magic 1 withstands overloads of up to 30G and easily repeats any turn you can come up with. Such missiles can be avoided with flares. For greater efficiency, using the flares should always be combined with evasive maneuvers. Not only to confuse the homing head, but also to get out of its way in time. By the way, the game has an option to automatically shoot off the flares at specific time intervals. To do this, go to Controls, Aircraft, Weaponry, Periodic Flare Release and configure the buttons to enable and disable the automatic mode. You can adjust its frequency right before the battle, as well as set the amount of flares you take into the fight. Finally, there are some planes that don't have flares at all. In those cases, escaping a modern missile will be difficult. But difficult doesn't mean impossible. There is a chance to deceive an infrared homing head in another way by flying between it and the sun so that it diverts to an even more powerful source of radiation. But it certainly won't happen all the time. Meanwhile, it looks like we've made it to mixed battles. Here, we start with getting rid of enemy aviation once again to protect both ourselves and our allies fighting on the ground. But even when the air is under our control, it may be a bit premature to start hunting down tanks. Because by that time, the enemy may have already got AA tech. Usually, you'll find them around the captain's respawn points, as most players don't bother traveling around the map. The best tactics for their destruction is diving at right angles, because most of their weapons can't elevate exactly vertically and it will be very difficult for them to hit you. Your offensive weapons will be quite enough against vehicles with open cabins, and the more protected ones deserve a personal present in the form of a bomb or a rocket. And if you play in a squad, attack the target simultaneously from different directions. One of you can dodge and draw fire on oneself, while the other one takes the kill without haste. On the highest BRs, there are radar and ground-to-air missiles coming into the equation. Fighting them is harder, but still real. The effectiveness of cannon systems noticeably decreases with the distance, and you will easily dodge a cannon burst at a distance of more than three kilometers. Anti-aircraft missiles have a much greater range, and if you notice the distinctive white trail in time, you can dodge them as well. As for destroying the top anti-aircraft guns, the approach here is the same as at the lower ranks. 
climbed to at least three, maybe three and a half kilometers and make a steep dive towards the target. Finally, in addition to anti-aircraft guns, helicopters are also quite common in top-tier fights. Usually, they have good air-to-air -air missiles and powerful artillery weapons in their noses, so it's safer to attack them in the rear hemisphere. While the enemy is turning around, you can easily destroy it with a burst of your forward-facing weapons. Alternatively, you can attack them from above. It'll be difficult for a helicopter to raise its nose that high. But no matter the mode, the most important thing is to constantly monitor the battlefield. A threat spotted at the right time brings you halfway to defeating it. The more often you look around, and the less you're involved with only one, even the most tempting target, the longer your aircraft will survive. The first question was sent by a player called Pratim Raut. Can I attach the tow cable to a friendly helicopter, which will lift my vehicle up? At the moment, every helicopter presented in the game is a strike helicopter. They're maneuverable, quite fast, but their carrying capacity is mostly limited to lifting their own ammo in the air. There are very few among them who can lift up even a light tank, not to mention a heavy one. Danson asks, can we damage the engine of a jet fighter if we shoot it right in the engine intake? Yep, you can damage the engine by shooting at it from whatever direction you want, including aiming at the intake. Then there's a question sent by Portuga. Gaijin, could you make a tutorial of how to angle the armor so the enemy shells can ricochet? Well, in short, the narrower the angle of impact between the round and the armor, the higher the probability of the ricochet. But it mostly depends on the specific construction features of your tank and the specific place where the enemy shoots, while your own actions have less of an impact on these situations. A separate tutorial won't be of much use here. Another question comes from Mohammed Hazik Aziraf bin Mohammed Yusuf. Could you suggest the best vehicle in the German tech tree? Well, overall, the German tech tree is quite balanced. There aren't any extremely powerful or extremely weak vehicles, or even extremely complicated ones to get used to. Personally, we have the most fun by playing on the Panzer IV F2, the Tiger H1 or E, the Panther D or A, the Panzer IV slash 70 V, the Tiger II P, the Jagdpanther, and the Leopard A1A1. Give them a try. You'll surely like some of these too. And the last question for today was written by Samuel Tomanov. Can you destroy a helicopter when you jump with a car or tank? Ooh, this one must look spectacular. <laughs> Let's give it a try. Well, here you go. Once more, that's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, which premieres every Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe to the channel, click the bell, leave a like. Don't forget to take part in the new season of World War and tell us what you think in the comments below. But say nice things. See you in 24-7. No, no. Seven days and seven nights. No, no. Okay, in a week. <laughs>